I said, I wish I had a key. Now see, uh, we're going to be talking about the keys this morning. Now I want you to get a picture of what you have. Now you don't only have one of these, you have nine of these. Just say, wow, that won't fit in my pocket. But how many of you know, to get our finite mind on what I want to say, I need something big. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How many of you know there's a lot going on in our world today that doesn't seem to play that out? But how many of you know it does not change the word of God? It doesn't go by what we see or what we feel or what our emotions are trying to tell us. But how many of you know it is by the word of God that we have to live our lives? And in fact, a lot of people, it's, it's really challenging. How many of you know some people love all the Word? Some people love the portions they like, and other people don't like the Word at all. And I mean, seriously, that, that's really kind of what's going on today. But how many of you know it doesn't make the Word any less effective with feelings? And I say that because uh, I had somebody this week bring me a key I said, I wish I had a key. Now see, uh, we're going to be talking about the keys this morning. Now I want you to get a picture of what you have. Now you don't only have one of these, you have nine of these. Just say, wow, that won't fit in my pocket. But how many of you know, to get our finite mind on what I want to say, I need something big. Because, you know, some of you got this little key in your head that's about this big and it unlocks a master lock or something. But how many of you know the keys of heaven are much bigger than the keys on earth? And I say this because so often as we really look at life, how many of you know God does not think small at all? In fact, when he created, he created enough mass for all of us to not only be living comfortably but the power of God to even expand you know we all talk about population in the world and all of these things but how many of you know the earth is big enough for all of us Amen. and God said go ye therefore into all the earth and populate the world go ye therefore into all the world and teach them the things I have taught you how many of you know he expected the world to be large enough not only for his gospel but also his people Hallelujah. and now I say this because I think the biggest things we can have, and we talked a number of times about the gates of hell will not prevail. What does that mean? What does that mean God is going to build a church? He's going to set it and establish it on the revelation of Jesus Christ. But it literally means that the powers of darkness can no longer hide. How many of you know where light is? In fact, it even says really where darkness is, light much more abounds. In other words, the light of the gospel, the light of our lives, how many of you know no matter what it seems like in our world, how dark it gets, educationally, spiritually, whatever you want to say, I admit that we have an enemy, an adversary that is trying to destroy the things of God, but how many of you know, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And I literally mean that from my heart because we have to take that literally to mean that no matter what happens, God has established this thing called the church and the gates of hell cannot come against it. In fact, the gates of hell literally cannot even stand because of it. Because they are exposed because of the church and the individuals of the church. But then he goes on and he says in 16 that I'm going to give you the keys of heaven. And that which you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And that which you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now how many of you know he's telling us something there. He's really saying and, and I said in the first service but it's so true. He did not say he was going to give us the keys to heaven. He said he was going to give us the keys of heaven. That's right. Jesus is our only way to heaven. And that's our, that, key is our, that door has already been opened. That's right. That's right. And how many of you know then if that's the case, then we don't need the keys to heaven. We need the keys of heaven. There you go. 
Because what God has always tried to do through Jesus Christ is to bring heaven on earth. To reconcile us once again to himself that we now live below what God wants. St. John 10.10 10 says, Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have came that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. Everybody say life. life. Now what abundance literally means, it means nothing missing, nothing broken. You might see the lack that's in your life. How many of you know God sees the completeness of your life? You might see what isn't there. God sees what is there. So many times we focus on the negative and yet the positive can even be bigger. Now listen to me very carefully. I had a young man years ago that was actually a, a doctor. And he said the way our mind works many times is... He said, I've had patients that weren't supposed to live and all of a sudden, miraculously, something happened in their life. Now, he didn't understand I knew what miraculous meant. He didn't. But he said, miraculously, somehow they got better and they are living a fulfilled life today. But I've also had other patients that came in with a problem that I didn't think was severe but now they've passed on. He said, I always remember the ones that passed on greater than the ones that lived. And what was he really saying? I said, because you're only seeing that in the natural realm. And if we only look in the natural realm, how many of you know we always see the negative before we see the positive? <coughs> Come on, church, are you out there? Because we live in a world that doesn't understand the power of right thinking. That doesn't understand the power of the Word of God. It's foolishness to them. But how many of you know it's light, health, and life to us that find it? And so with that being said, I believe the keys to life and what Jesus was talking about is found in the gifts to the church, in the nine gifts to the church. I believe those are the keys. Because if you look at keys, if you look at the anointing, he was talking about the church there, and then Paul in his writings through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says that the keys are going to be given to the church, and they're going to be called gifts, and out of those gifts, they are going to damage the darkness of the world in which you live. And they will bring great destruction but how many of you know we have to have those nine gifts operating? And even in some circles today, even in Christendom, in Christianity, many people don't even believe in some of these gifts anymore. They feel they've done away with or they never did. How many of you know that salvation has not been done away with? Evangelism has not been done away with? Well, then why do they believe that these other things, because what I'm about to talk about this morning, I believe is probably one of the greatest gifts or greatest keys that we have. And it's probably the most misunderstood gift and key. Now, let me just reiterate in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Everybody say all. all. In other words, your gift is not given to you for you alone to do your little thing with. Your gifts from the Holy Spirit, your keys, are not only to unlock doors for you, but they're there to unlock doors for someone else too. And what most people don't understand is how many of you know you play a greater part in the plan of God in other people's life as much as God does play a plan in your life. And what's amazing is many people just think, well, I, I get these keys, I get these things, and I can unlock things in my life, and I can bring blessing and goodness, and I can uh, lock up the things that I don't want to come in. But how many of you know, it isn't about you, it's about the church. Amen. Amen. Because he said, I give these gifts that all may profit. So in other words, when you're not using your keys, you're not just affecting you, you could be affecting someone else from their breakthrough to come. And then he describes the gifts. He says, For to one I give the word of wisdom by the Spirit. To another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another faith. Everybody say faith. Amen. To another the gift of healing by the same Spirit. Now I covered these, if you will, in the last two weeks. We talked about wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge goes beyond things that we see. 
The word of wisdom is a supernatural revelation of the mind, will, and purpose of God. How many of you want the purpose of God in your life? Well, you can't have that without wisdom. Because it's a divine revelation from God about you. But it shows you who you are, not just to show you who you are so you can be better. He's showing you who you are so you can help others become who they need to be in God. Amen. Too many people you receive that just for themselves. But your mind, will, and emotion is worked out because you might have someone come across your path this week that need a word from God, not a word from you, but a rhema word that's going to change their life. And you never know that the word of wisdom, in fact, knowledge really stops wisdom. Because knowledge, I, I, poor Pastor Mike, we talk sometimes between service and, and he said, I see things so differently than most people. He said, I see people in the world and educated people like being in box one. And anything that isn't natural, it can't operate out of that box. Well, wisdom breaks that box. You know, so, no, listen to me. Everybody say, I love Pastor, but I'm going to say something here. Uh, I think we color inside the lines in our lives too much. I think sometimes we need to color outside the lines. We teach our kids, you know, we take all the creativity out of them by saying, you've got to fit it all in this little box. Hello? Good preaching, huh? Well, God's kids only color inside the box a lot of times when God is saying, expand the lines. They're not there for you because you have the wisdom of God. Amen. You have the knowledge of God. You have something that is from heaven that's coming to earth that will not only help you, but it can bring deliverance to other people. Right. And then we talked about knowledge and the word of how knowledge is, is good, but just knowledge alone without using the other gifts will puff us up. It'll make us think we're more important than we are. How many of you know? A lot of us, in fact... Uh, now I should have really said love pastor, but how many of you know that most of us know more than we do? Does anybody believe that? Just turn to your neighbor and say, you're smarter than you think you are. Because really you know sometimes what to do, but how many of you know you don't always do what you know? Can I get an amen there? Uh, you know, Paul had this same problem when he said, I don't always do what I'm supposed to do but thank God for grace. Come on, church. Are you out there? I mean, most of us don't. I mean, the Baptists, they really understand grace. I'm not sure about us charismatic sometimes. We can be a little judgmental. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then we talked about faith. And this is beyond just a little measure of faith. This is supernatural faith. And I talked about the, the story of the five loaves and the two fishes and the ground between where the people were and where Jesus sent them. If you remember if you were here last week and... And that's real power because all of us have some ground of faith sometimes that we got to cross. And it goes beyond just having that little measure of faith or whatever. It goes beyond what we see in the basket and it goes beyond feeding somebody else. How many of you know you don't have to know it all to help somebody through their life? You don't have to go to Bible school, not that those things are wrong, or you don't have to be trained. How many of you know sometimes God just drops things into your heart and it might be that loaf and that fish that somebody else needs? Amen. And the more you let somebody else take from that basket, I believe that God fills that basket full. I think it's really done in a lot of different ways than we even see. That's real faith. To say, God, you know, listen, man, when I started, I can't even listen to the tapes when I first started preaching. That's how bad they are. But how many of you know I stayed with it? Turn to your neighbor and say, hallelujah. But, you know what I'm saying? We... By faith you do things. You cross that ground. You do things that are supernatural. You don't just fit yourself in what a pattern is. And then we also talked last week about healing. How many of you know many people don't even believe in healing today? Breaks my heart. I mean, God wants to heal. And talked about, you know, them going into the temple and the power of God moving on Peter and John. And, and such as I have, I give unto you. And lifting up the man and him healed. And you know, it's funny because a lot of people would say, well, why was he... You know, was he, why was he sick? Did God make him sick? He said, no. But the glory of God may be manifested. How many of you know that which the enemy means for bad, God can turn to good? Amen. I really believe that in my heart. 
Because I know I don't always understand why bad things happen to good people, but I know one thing. God will not fall short if you'll stay the course. You can't go by just that moment or that circumstances that some tragedy comes in your life. You have to keep walking, putting one foot in front of the other and believing God by faith and not by sight and knowing that maybe I haven't got my healing yet, but it's on its way and I'll either get it this side of glory or the other side of glory, but I'll be healed in the name of Jesus. And I don't always understand healing. I, there's people I prayed for that have been supernaturally, miraculously touched from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. But how many of you know there's other people that didn't seem to get their healing? It's not up to me to understand healing. It's up to me to do what the Bible tells me to do and pray for the sick. And so we have to do that. And where I want to pick up now this morning is I believe the most misunderstood gift of all. And in Corinthians, the next gift is called the gift of miracles. Everybody say miracles. Yes. Miracles are so misunderstood. In fact, I think it's the hardest because he goes on to say, the word of knowledge, word of faith, and healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles and to another prophecy. Now these are the two I want to talk about this morning. Everybody say miracles. Yeah. Now let me define miracles for you if I may and give you kind of a, a heads up. It is a supernatural invention into the ordinary course of nature. In other words, how many of you know there are certain things in nature that are common? How many of you know things like walking on the water is not a common thing to nature? Hello? How many of you know if you drink poison to the nature's eye, you could die, but Jesus said you can drink poison, be bitten by a viper, and still live. It has to do with wisdom, has to do with knowledge, has to do with healing, has to do with faith, but it's a manifestation of almost anything that is outside the norm. And let me tell you right now, our world does not, in fact, even Jesus, when he walked on the water, even Jesus, when he stood up in the boat and rebuked the wind in the storm, even his disciples said, who is this man? Because their natural mind could not wrap itself around what was going on. And can I tell you, one of the reasons why we don't see miracles many times in this nation is because we became too sophisticated, educated, and want to know everything by natural means instead of spiritual means. Amen. Are you out there? Amen. Because we see miracles, documented cases of miracles, people brought back from life supernatural things where people do supernatural things that go beyond the realm of a natural world and they have no problem in third world countries believing that. Right. Now you can believe this if not and I know it's going out and I know we will be called that church again. <laughs> but how many of you know I believe miracles happen? And I've seen miracles happen in my own life, but many times what people do is they look at it and say, oh, I was lucky. You weren't lucky. You had a divine intervention of the Spirit of God showing up in your life, and it saved your life. I mean, people don't live by luck that know Jesus. They live by divine appointment. The word promises and says, our steps are ordered by the Lord. Yes. Everybody say, my steps, my steps are, ordered are ordered by the Lord. By the Lord. Now listen to me. There was a time when I was coming back from hunting one time, and, and you can call it luck, you can call it circumstance, you can call it intervention, you can put any name to it, but to me it was a miracle. I'm going about 60 miles an hour down this one-way road, and there's a cross street coming on, and I was with Sandy's dad. We had been up in the hills hunting. And we were tired and I wasn't paying attention and I was going faster than I should have been going. Amen. And don't look at me like deer in the headlights there. <laughs> I repented later. But I'm going down the road and all of a sudden I see this school bus coming to this road. And it has a stop sign and I have just a, there's no road crossing. It wasn't a four corners. It was just a T. And the school bus was on the road, but it did not stop 
When I got about from here to the doors, it pulled out right in front of me and there was no way I could stop. I didn't even hit my brakes, but I went around that school bus and on this side, there was about eight mailboxes concreted in the ground. Somehow, I really mean this, I believe God supernaturally shrunk my truck <laughs> to be able to get through there because we got through there and to the human eye, the human mind, that was not supposed to happen. I was supposed to either hit the school bus or hit the mailboxes and I hit neither. And I remember getting on the other side and the first words out of my mouth was, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> not, wow, was I lucky. <laughs> because literally, square foot, however you want to do it in the natural, measure it out, that truck should not have went through there. But how many of you know that's a miracle? Many of us have miracles in our life all the time and we just think it's luck. When it's a divine invention of the Spirit of God and His miracle working on our behalf. Amen. Can somebody say amen? amen? Now, let me tell you another thing about miracles. You can say what you want because I wanted to tell you a story like that because some of you might remember last week I talked about a man named Barnabas from India. And so let me talk about people overseas and what really happens there. Documented fact, this man, when you become a Christian, at that time in India, this was 30 some years ago, your family ostracized you. You were no longer part of the family. They kicked you out of the house. If you lived there, they did not believe in this Christianity thing. It's really moving in their country, but you got to remember this was 35 years ago. Well, he was out going to a church in the country away from the major metropolitan city and a witch doctor and his cohorts literally captured him and tied him to a tree and piled wood around the tree and they were going to burn him alive because he was a Christian. And he said, in the name of Jesus, I don't accept this. I believe you can do whatever it takes to spare my life. And God literally translated his body from where he was, transformed his body from where he was to where he lived. Wow. Now see, some people go, well, that doesn't make sense. Good. Because miracles don't make sense. This is why the world doesn't want them. Because then they got to explain in the natural. Have you ever watched how the world tries to explain the flood? Have you ever seen how the world tries to, well, you know, it's a hilarious thing. It's kind of like God did a miracle when he delivered the children of Israel, when he parted the Red Sea. And people say, well, you know, scientists want to say, well, you know, it was only knee deep where they crossed. It should have been no problem for them to cross anyway. Okay, let's say it was knee deep. Then knee deep water destroyed Pharaoh's army. <laughs> However you want to look at it, it's a miracle. Come on, church. I mean, science will never make sense to miracles. And this is why miracles are so misunderstood in the body of Christ even, and among our world, because they want to make sense of it with their mind when a miracle goes beyond the natural realm into the spiritual realm. And so the key is really, if you understand the keys, the power of these keys, then that means Something is unlocked in your life that will create a thing that goes against the nature or natural means of this world and brings you into a spiritual place that anything is possible with God. Amen. Philippians said, I can do all things through Christ. Did he mean all or all? all. Did he mean miracles? Then that's, that, I said, did you do miracles? That was, a pretty, that was a pretty weak amen there. Because most of our, this is one of the most controversial gifts because most people want to understand it, rationalize it, have it work for them. That same man, Pastor Sandy reminded me of this last week, was carrying a small pocket Bible. Little, you seen the little pocket Bibles? Mm -hmm. Another time he was in his country and a person shot a 30-odd six shell, rifle, 
shot him, and it hit that Bible, and it never penetrated his skin. He fell down from the percussion of it, but it never even penetrated the kit, the, his skin because that little bitty Bible stopped the 30 odd. Si now, if you was to go out in the natural realm and put, a whole, put this Bible out there, that would penetrate that Bible. And he was carrying that Bible around, and here it had a little hole in it, had the bullet that had hit that. So you can either believe not in miracles, or you can believe in miracles. Amen. It is your choice. Because there is documented things about the miracles of God, that God can do supernatural things that go against the nature. I'm preaching better than y'all are amen. amen. Because I believe a lot of people don't understand miracles because they can't wrap their mind around it. Therefore, our world, it becomes foolishness to them. So we stop doing it so we don't look like foolishness. When I want to tell you, in the kingdom of God, you're foolish if you don't believe in miracles. Amen. It's one of the nine gifts to the church that he mentions that comes by the Spirit of God. Why won't we use them? Why won't we take them out of these four walls to people that need help and the blessing of God? Now, miracles can also be things that are supernatural, prophetic things. Because what I want to close with this morning is, he also said that he will give the gift of prophecy. Now this is not as misunderstood, but it can be different to your mind. How many of you know that I think if John the Baptist was walking around in camel skin and eating locusts and telling everybody to repent, we wouldn't call him a prophet, we'd call him a heretic. Amen. Because he was called a heretic in his own day. How many of you know prophets are, this, this gift is, and let me say something about this gift. Uh, somebody said something last week and I used it in the first service but it's so true you can be used in these gifts and you can be used one time or two times it might not be your necessary primary gifts but God can use all nine of these gifts with any of us in this room at any time he wants but it might not be your primary gift there are primary gifts that God gives us the Holy Spirit gives us and then we can be used if we'll be open to be used in those gifts no matter what they are Amen. In my own life, really, if we look at prophecy, it says it's a message from God, a supernatural utterance inspired by the Holy Spirit in a known tongue prophetically, which makes the ability that goes beyond the ability of your learned ability, your preaching ability, your teaching ability. All those things in Ephesians 10 are also gifts that edify the body of Christ. But a prophetic word is something even beyond that. Right. It goes beyond just what I'm even doing right now. It goes where you speak from the Spirit in a natural voice, in a natural language, to tell someone else about their life. And how many of you know that can make you feel uncomfortable? Because if a prophet's in the room, if, a, if we have a prophet come in, and, and I used, I've been used in this gift a number of times, I used to feel uncomfortable with prophets because I didn't know what they were going to say. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about in here? In fact, I've told this story, but let me tell you again. Pastor Dick, when I met him, uh, he used to say, Steve, I've got this resident prophet in my church, and everything she says comes true. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Well, I'm down at his church one time, and he introduces her to me. And I mean, she seems as weird, <laughs> different, maybe a better word, <laughs> peculiar. <laughs> because she kind of really, Pastor Sandy and Pastor Mike were there that day. She really hit it off with me. And every time I'd go to his church, which back then was really frequent, she would have a new word for me. And she wouldn't just say the word, half the people in the room would hear the word. She didn't come up, oh, Pastor Steve, I got a word when I was praying for you this morning. And I mean, half the room could hear what she was saying. And you know, when she said, I got a word for you, I was always going, oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about in here? I mean, prophets can be different. I mean, when John was in the room, John the Baptist, how many of you know, everybody knew he was in the room. Well, I felt a little uncomfortable and I remember one time and she had given me words and they started to come to pass the thing she was speaking to me and I'm like wow 
But I still had this flesh problem. Because when she would come in a room, like I was in a room with probably a couple hundred pastors or a hundred pastors and their wives, at least 200 people in the room. And we're all having this banquet down at Pastor Brunel's and there's all kinds of people from all over the country there. And, and the room is full, but I have one chair next to me and all the other places, maybe three chairs in the entire room empty. And she walked in the room and I remember going, oh gosh, I hope she don't see me. <laughs> I'm telling the truth, I'll tell it on myself. Because I was like, oh Lord, don't let her sit by me. Don't let her come over here. <laughs> you remember this? <laughs> and so I'm kind of looking down, trying to not look at the door or anything. And the room's probably about twice the size of this room. And uh, it was hilarious. Sure enough, she saw me. And I knew she was coming because I'm kind of looking, you know. <laughs> sure enough, she walks right over there sits down and I mean she had not been there a minute and she stood up when I was praying this morning I got a word for you and I'm like, oh, but do you know I hate to say this that lady now has went on to glory but do you know everything she spoke to me has came to pass my flesh was not always comfortable with it but the Lord really had to minister me and say you don't understand this gift. You don't understand because it's not your gift. And then he took me back to a time. I had been saved three months. And I was in our small little church. We had about 50 people in the church, all young couples. And this girl named Debbie stood up and she said, I'm really dealing with this problem in my life and I can't seem to overcome it. And before the words ever finished out of her mouth, the Spirit said to me, you go and tell her that she is to go home today, go in the bedroom, leave her son and husband in the living room and shut the door in her bedroom, kneel down at her bed Confess the problem, and when she gets up, leave it right there, and then shut the door behind you. Amen. And I didn't tell her that. Because I was intimidated. I was about three months old in the Lord. I didn't even know the books of the Bible. And here the Holy Spirit is dropping a prophetic word in my heart. And so I kind of wrestled with it, and after a while we were, we were gone. I don't know if it was that Sunday or the next day. But I told Pastor Sandy, I said, Honey, I, I got this word yesterday when Debbie was talking. And, you know, Sandy said, Well, you should have shared that with her. And I said, I was afraid she'd wonder, you know, who, who are this guy? He's been saved three months, and here he's telling me what to do. It was more pride than really any. And I think pride keeps a lot of prophecy from happening. Yes. Hello? Amen. And so I didn't tell her. And Sandy... And I prayed about it all week long. Well, I get back to church the very next Sunday. The girl stands up and says exactly the same thing. I said, Holy Spirit, I'm slow, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> I might not be the best timed person. So after church that Sunday, I went to her and I gave her exactly what I told you, in exact words almost. Four o'clock in the afternoon, the phone rings, and guess who it is? Debbie and she said that lifted for me whatever it was and I am never going to let it come back on me again Amen. see that's a gift where you turn a key for someone else and many times people are afraid of that gift because it does it makes you feel uncomfortable it might make you now remember this though it's always delivering, encouraging, and exhorting. It is never to correct nor to abuse people. Because I've had people, I was in a service one day when someone said, Yay, yay, the Lord is not in this place. Well, then how did he prophesy? <laughs> they say some people use this, they, they get in the flesh... And what they were really saying is, I'm not feeling anything in this service, so I better say something. And say it's the Lord. 
Because how many of you know this can't do with your intellect or wisdom? It has to do with encouragement, exhorting, and lifting up. Now in the Old Testament, people prophesied of things. But in the New Testament, when Jesus used this word, remember, remember Jesus healing the blind man with the mud? That is a form of healing, but it was also a form of prophecy. Because he made mud put the mud on his eyes, and then said, go wash in the pool. That was a prophetic word coming out of his heart from the Holy Spirit. He was telling him, sometimes prophecy needs you to do something with it. Right. Many people say, well, I got the word, I wrote it down, that's it. No, do something, act on it. If a prophetic person gives you something, be ready to do something with your faith, your knowledge, your wisdom, and healing. Amen. Because it works by bringing destruction to the kingdom of darkness, and sometimes you've got to walk that out. Now that man received his healing. Jesus had already healed him before he was healed, but because he did what he said, he was healed. Yes. Right. Are you there? See, a lot of people don't understand prophecy also needs an active part of our life. Because sometimes it will just be instantaneous, like healing. Other times you'll have to do something with it. Because remember, it's, an inner, it's a message, a supernatural message from God through the Holy Spirit to bring... In the New Testament, it spoke of people being edified, lifted up, and encouraged. So remember, God maybe wants to use you in that gift. But make sure you have a submitted heart. And you're not harsh or critical. Come on, church. Are you there? Because many people take this gift or say they have the gift of prophecy, the key, and they use it for harm versus encouragement. It's there to encourage us, but it is a gift of God that really supersedes the natural realm of things going on in our life. But it will be a prophetic word. Now listen to me very carefully. Not in every case, but in many cases, particularly when people don't give you, when people give you something in a prophetic word that you have to act on like that man did, remember that it has to bear witness with your heart. The man wanted healing before Jesus healed him. He knew he wanted that. Hello? God bore witness with that man to ask Jesus to heal him. He got his healing and a prophetic thing to do, and it was in his heart that that's what he wanted, so he went and did that. Don't let anybody prophesy to you something that isn't in your heart. Many people forget that, because they're so vulnerable and so, if you will, they want to listen to anybody, and they, they want people, and I worked in prophecy, and, and there again, you also have to be careful that if you don't have a word, keep your mouth shut. I was preaching in a church in Whittier, and I was giving words to people, and people were getting set free, and God was telling me things like, you're a prayer partner with that lady over there, and I didn't know these ladies at all, and they started crying, both of them, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I either missed it or hit it. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then I find out later, they've been praying for 25 years together. I mean, I had no idea. I'd never met them. And God was doing this. Well, I had my books, and after the service, it was a great service, and I was out, and I was signing books for people. And this one lady came up to me and said, Don't you have a word for me? I said, No, I don't have a word for you. I used that gift in the service, and when the God was done, he was done. So I'm signing books again, and she comes through the line again and says, don't you have a word for me? I said, yeah, I have a word for you. I have no word. <laughs> How many of you know, I mean, you can't just make that work. It better be the Holy Spirit and it'll be fruit. 
if it's a spirit. But a lot of people, they're running around wanting words. I mean, you know, I, I've had people say, well, I got to follow the fire. I got to go where the fire is falling. I got to go over here. Oh, they're prophesying. I got to go to that meeting. I'm not saying don't go, but you can't go for that reason. You got to go to just be used. Amen. Because you might, you might go five, you might go 20 nights in a row and never get a word. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have been at the meeting. Anything that will edify, build you up, and encourage you. So understand these gifts. Understand these keys because they're so important in our life. 